Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Serial Talker podcast. I'm Peter Von Gom, and today we have part two of James Forsyth's memoirs. As a prisoner of war in Belgium during World War II, he was captured by the Germans and endured a horrific internment, along with many other American and Allied prisoners. The Battle of the Bulge started December 16, 1944. James Forsyth and his battalion were bunkered in the Ardennes Forest, awaiting the arrival of the German troops. The weather conditions were absolutely miserable. It was winter, heavy snowfall, and Hitler used this as his strategy. It became the costliest part of the battle for the Americans, with over 100,000 casualties between December 16th and January 25th of 1945. James Forsyth became a prisoner of war and wrote down his memoirs for his friend Kurt Gomes, who shared this story with us. Okay, enough of the history lesson. Let's get on with part two of this riveting story. Kriegsgefangener, prisoner of war, number X11A081494. In some of the camps, we built little Kriegi burners. Kriegi is what we POWs called ourselves. They were like small forges. We built them out of mostly tin cans with a fan and a crank made from a welding rod or other stiff wire to turn the fan. You could boil a few potatoes or a little soup with a handful of wood chips. You couldn't survive on the vile food that the Germans issued us. You had to be industrious enough to supplement your food with anything you could come up with and by any and all means. I remember an occasion where a Russian detail of men were sent out to a factory to perform some work. Apparently, the Germans discovered that the Russians from the work detail had stolen a tool from the job site. Early that evening, the Germans turned a search dog loose in the Russian compound, intending that the dog would find the guilty person. The dog was never seen again. The story is that the Russians butchered the dog and had a feast. There were no rats, cats, dogs, in or around the compound. They were all considered a delicacy. The occupants were near death from starvation and would eat anything. I have no use for thieves and liars. However, I and most other prisoners were reduced to stealing anything we could use. When I was out on a work detail, I stole anything useful that I could hide under my clothes and bring into the camp. At times I came into the camp with potatoes in my pants leg. You quickly learned which guards wouldn't perform a detailed search when you returned to the camp and would take a bribe or turn their heads and allow small, harmless items to be brought in. About a year before I was captured, I was a physical specimen. I weighed 178 pounds, 6 feet tall, 29-inch waist, 48-inch chest, flawless teeth, extremely strong, never defeated, in any and all styles of wrestling from college rules to no rules full contact fighting. Due to my experience and ability in the martial arts, I was extensively trained in the Air Force for special commando services where courage and knowledge were required. When I was liberated from the Stalag and transported to Reims, France and in a hospital for a month, I weighed 118 pounds had extreme dysentery, scurvy, lice, acute arthritis, bed sores on shoulders, hips, and back, considerable tooth decay, and frostbitten feet. I had survived only by courage and determination. I was a wreck of a human being compared to my former health. In prison, I never had a change of clothes, a toothbrush, or a bath for five months and seventeen days. At Reims, France, some of the American cooks actually cried at seeing the wretched condition of us ex-prisoners. They had all the wonderful food to treat us in grand fashion. However, they knew that our stomachs had shrunk, and if given all the food we could eat, we would have foundered and killed ourselves. They had to feed us very little and increase the ration very slowly until we were capable of eating regularly. I wish to state that there has never been the daring and compassion for a fellow man than under war conditions. Those young men, on all occasions, gave it all to assist, help, or save a life of a countryman without considering his own danger. 
At the hospital in Reims, France, just after our liberation from prison, we would get two or three in each bed, as we were accustomed to cuddling while in prison to attempt to keep warm. It appeared quite strange to the people who had not been prisoners. A smaller soldier carrying a severely wounded man on his back was asked if he was too heavy for you. The soldier replied, He's not heavy. He's my buddy. After a month in the Rames Hospital, I was standing in line for hours to board a military transport plane to the U.S. I became unstable and fell to the ground. I was placed back into the hospital for a few days and then sent by truck to the coast of France and boarded an LST ship for a trip of 22 days back to New York. The LST, a very small, flat-bottomed ship, was well supplied with food. We liberated prisoners enjoyed the food, keeping warm, and the treatment and care of the crew of the ship, as if it had been a five-star hotel. At New York, they gave us a homecoming dinner any food we could think of, then sent us by bus or train to our various locations. My homecoming dinner, as I most desired, was steak, ice cream, and milk. I was put on a train for a two-day trip to Paragold, Arkansas, closest station to home. Midway of the trip, a conductor from Cincinnati, Ohio, took me home with him to stay overnight with his family, rather than sleep in the train station. I believe the conductor may have lost a son in the war, and perhaps he enjoyed my stay at his house as much as I did. Then, the next day, I boarded a train to continue to Paragold, Arkansas. Paragold was a few miles from my home at Leechville. A neighbor that I knew, Hatley Robbins, stopped to give me a ride. Hatley had been in Paragold overnight with his mistress. Hatley told me of his great achievements of eating enough aspirin to appear to have a heart murmur, and beat the draft. He'd made lots of money during the war by buying and selling rationed farm equipment. Hatley dropped me off at my home. My parents nearly passed out. They had never received news of my release. The only news they received was from an English girl I dated a few times while in London, Alice Shine. Alice knew how to get news from the War Department, and she learned that I was missing in action. She wrote to my parents to tell them the bad news that I was missing in action. They eventually received information that I was alive and was a POW. With no further news, they had given up hope and assumed that I was dead. Seven days at home and then to the Army Navy Hospital in Hot Springs, Arkansas for 30 days restoration, discharged and went home. I wish to enlighten my friends that may read this document that all Germans were not bad. I've always believed that many Germans did not condone the actions of the war, that they were caught up in the circumstances simply because of where they were born, in Germany. I had more respect for the Germans than most other nationals in Europe. I had on more than one occasion experienced that myself and other prisoners were treated with all the kindness that circumstances afforded. The Germans had fought a long, hard war and had little for themselves, much less having to share what they had with thousands of prisoners. One time, several of us prisoners had been walking constantly for several days. The guards found a large barn on the outskirts of a small village. They commandeered the barn and kept us prisoners overnight in it. The owner of the barn and a beautiful young daughter probably 18 years of age, came into the barn to talk to us. We expected, as usual, a propaganda speech about how great the Germans were. The young lady mixed in the crowd and talked to individual prisoners with ease. She implied that they would soon have some food for us. In about two hours, we were beckoned to come to the back of their house to eat. We found that they had made a very large kettle, wash pot of soup, we were invited to eat our fill. The soup was made with carrots, potatoes, turnips, barley, and horse meat. Horse meat was common in Germany. At the time, I thought this was the best soup I had ever eaten. They also had an abundance of good bread, fruit preserves, and honey butter. Honey butter was made from coal. It tasted like a mix of honey and real butter. 
As it turned out, the man was the burgermeister, mayor of the village. He had lived in St. Louis, Missouri for many years. He had operated a well-known piano store and was a successful citizen in St. Louis. He was back in Germany when the war started to handle the title work of properties that was willed to him by his German parents. He couldn't leave Germany for the duration of the war. Bear in mind that the finest young people were the first to go into service. They were also the first to die to save this most wonderful United States. For all to appreciate and enjoy, they had the courage and guts to do the job. Most of their guts are still over there. Who knows how many future geniuses that had a productive future ahead of them were snuffed out by a 10-cent bullet. For several years, I was angry with all the Americans here in the States that griped because they had to endure rationing of butter, sugar, meat, and gasoline while working at an overpaid job that they wouldn't have had if it weren't for the war. They should have seen and endured my conditions. Now all is forgiven. Possibly every person has in some way did something or said something that physically or mentally harmed another person. The war did both mental and physical damage to all that were there. To survive it was necessary to forget our past experiences and pick up the scraps of our lives and move ahead. I therefore have many years purposely tried to forget my war experiences. The scars have somewhat healed, and now I think it's important to share my war experiences with friends and family. I have many times thought of the guts, courage, and compassion of the many military leaders, admirals, and generals that have had the duty, requirement, and opportunity to commit a division of many thousands of young men to attack a known enemy position, knowing that all or most of the young men were being sacrificed as a diversion to enhance the chances of greater success of another action. Consider the gravity of the decision of President Roosevelt, General Eisenhower, and Bernard Montgomery to commit millions of young men to invade the coast of France, knowing that the majority of the young men were to be slaughtered for the preservation of the principles of this great country. Unless you were there, it's not possible that you would understand how close and devoted we young men were. We depended upon each other for our very lives. The most endearing friend and buddy that I ever knew, Dwight Stokes, was in all the same conditions that occurred until I was captured at the beginning of the Battle of the Bulge. I lost contact with my buddy Dwight for over 58 years. We found each other and made contact in October 2002. There are unintended omissions and errors in this document. I've written it from memory. I'm getting more facts and dates from Dwight, who continued in the battles until the end of the war. Dwight was a most courageous young man, and, like myself, he was very fortunate to have survived the ordeal in one piece. I gained much courage from Dwight. On an occasion before we went to Europe, we were on our first forced march, meaning that we had a full backpack of more than 35 pounds, plus a nine-pound rifle, bayonet, and full combat gear. Dwight was born with a foot folded over. The problem was corrected. However, it was an issue for him all his life. On this forced march, we were to walk at a very fast pace for 25 miles in five and a half hours with all this weight on our backs. This was a test of courage that verified our courage and stamina. A march like this made weaklings out of all except those with great courage and stamina. I mentioned to Dwight that I was very tired. Just griping, Dwight while limping on his sensitive foot, and also being smaller in stature than myself, told me to lean on his shoulder for some rest and support. I couldn't accept Dwight's offer to lean on him. His offer gave me an extension of my own courage and a lesson in courage that I have not and will not ever forget. I hope that every American will watch the actual documentary of the Battle of the Bulge. Only then will you really understand and appreciate the courage and comradeship of those courageous young men. I will never understand 
how so-called intelligent governments, heads of state, leaders, dictators, can and do provoke a war and cause the death of millions of human beings. There's never been a war or military conflict of major proportions throughout documented history that was not totally or somewhat based on religious beliefs. Every German helmet was inscribed across the front, Gott mit uns, God is with us. Forgive me for not recognizing the mental anguish of my parents who drove me off to the county seat to catch the bus to go off to the war. James D. Forsyth. And there you have it. The memoirs of World War II prisoner of war, James D. Forsyth. What a pleasure to read this, and what an eye-opening experience to have lived through and to carry those memories with him all his life. There are some additional bits of notable information that I would like to share. It's from the Mercury News, which is a newspaper in the Bay Area. Back in 2003, there was an article written about James Forsyth. Listen to this. When James Forsyth was a 21-year-old U.S. Army infantryman fighting World War II in Europe, he was captured by German soldiers during the Battle of the Bulge and spent the rest of the war in prison camps. Forsyth, now a semi-retired Cupertino businessman, always wondered what happened to his best friend and fellow soldier, Dwight Stokes. He last saw Stokes a few hours before German forces launched a massive surprise counterattack against the advancing Allied armies near Bastogne, Belgium, in the waning hours of the war. Forsyth, now 79, didn't know if Stokes had been killed or captured or survived the war to return home to the United States. Fifty-eight years later, the Internet, fifty-eight years later, the Internet helped to give him the answer. His friend is eighty years old and well, and called him. They'll meet in Tennessee this week. It was an unbelievable shock to get the call, Forsyth said. I'd more or less resolved that he was gone, dead in the war or since. I guess he had more time to prepare because he did know I was alive. It was cold turkey when he called me. The two met in Army Air Force's pilot training in 1943, but the Army transferred both into the infantry because it needed soldiers more than airmen. Stokes and I became inseparable. Then, when we got overseas, we relied on each other for our very lives. There were times your life wasn't worth a plugged nickel without your buddy to take care of your backside, Forsyth said. Eventually, they ended up in the 106th Infantry Division and arrived in France a few days after the June 6, 1944, invasion of Europe. On December 16, 1944, in the bitter cold, they hit us. Nineteen German divisions went through us, Forsyth said. His friend Stokes was leading a separate squad a quarter mile away when the battle began. It was the nastiest thing. It was slaughter, Forsyth said. After the war... Forsyth returned to his native Arkansas, bought a truck, and went into business hauling goods. Later, he ran his own restaurant and sometimes worked 20 hours a day. Fast forward 58 years. One day, I got the surprise of my life when I found out J.D. Forsyth in California was looking for me, Stokes said. 58 years of silence and not knowing and have it come out of the blue. It was quite an exciting thing. On Wednesday, Forsyth and his daughter will fly to Memphis to make arrangements for his 80th birthday bash with five or six of my greatest friends, and Stokes is number one. And finally, one final note from James Forsyth to his friend Curtis Gomes. Dear friend, I wish your tour of the World War II invasion and battlegrounds of Western Europe is rewarding to you. It certainly will be a somber one. You make me proud that even though you weren't there during the difficult times, you're willing to spend your valuable time and money to see and pay tribute to our fallen comrades. I do have a little favor to ask of you. I was stationed in Wintersfeld, Belgium, where the actual point of the Battle of the Bulge started, December 16th. As you know, it was the fiercest battle in history. The little village was covered 
with thousands of bodies of young men. The gutters ran red with the blood of both American and German youngsters. There was not a square foot of ground in the village that was not red. After the Germans had passed through, on their way toward France, there were a couple of hundred American prisoners assembled in the village to be walked toward Germany. As we were leaving, there were hundreds of Americans wounded, still alive, but couldn't walk. The Germans methodically walked around the wounded, executing any and all that couldn't get to their feet and walk. I know exactly why you're going on this trip, and truly appreciate your intentions. If you should pass through Wintersfeld, Belgium, please pick up a pebble for me as a memento to a fallen buddy. Thanks, Jim Forsyth. Thank you for tuning in to the Serial Talker podcast. If you have a compelling story you would like me to consider reading, please send it in to the email that's listed in the description of this podcast. If you would like to support the podcast, you could always buy me a cup of coffee. Very much appreciated. That information is also in the description of this podcast. If you're enjoying these podcasts, please consider subscribing and please share it with a friend who you think might be interested. Thanks, guys. Ciao for now.